Thanks for joining with us this evening online. Uh, we're continuing with the study in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1. We're going to finish up chapter 1 this evening. And this evening we have Ryan Carpenter in the house to preach to us. So uh, Ryan just graduated from Phoenix Seminary in May. Uh, so just graduated in May with an MDiv in biblical communication. So more than qualified uh, to expound to us the book of Ecclesiastes. So it should be fun. Come on up. And we'll hear from him. Well, good evening. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Well, whether you're watching here in person, which is just a few people, or you're here at home, uh, please raise your hand if you would like more wisdom. Yeah, I see all those hands on the live stream. Just kidding, uh, I can't see your webcams. Big brother might, but not me. Uh, I think most of us would like more wisdom for navigating life. And doesn't it seem like sometimes we just need a little bit more wisdom to get through whatever situation we're facing? You know, you might be a parent raising a rebellious child, and you have just done everything you can possibly think of to manage their behavior, and it's just not working, and you're at your wit's end. Wouldn't it be nice to have a little bit more wisdom uh, maybe, you are, uh, maybe you are a teenager, you know, or a child, uh, maybe not the rebellious one in the previous example, but you're a teenager, and you are trying to figure out what you want to do with your life. You know, what are you going to do when you graduate high school? Um, where do you want to go to college? Who should you date? When should you date? You know, how to stay out of trouble at home? Wouldn't it be nice to have a little more wisdom for that? Maybe you're retired, and you would like some wisdom for navigating your retirement. Uh, wisdom for how to manage your finances, wisdom for whether or not to take up a part-time job, uh, wisdom for, you know, whether you need to move closer to grandkids. Wouldn't it be nice to have a little more wisdom for navigating through that? Uh, personally, in the Carpenter household, we are expecting our first baby girl uh, in December, and so we would love some more wisdom for that, you know, how to get through this pregnancy, and even more importantly, how to raise our daughter. So I think all of us would like more wisdom, would we not? Um, so it's no surprise because of this, because of how important wisdom is, that the Bible has a lot to say about wisdom. Uh, if we look in the Old Testament, there are three books, Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, which are classified as wisdom literature. So they're really all about wisdom. And then some people would also include the book of Psalms and the book of Song of Solomon into that category as well. And if you're, if you're familiar with Proverbs, if you ever read through the book of Proverbs, you know that wisdom is spoken of very positively. Wisdom is often compared to great riches. You know, it's said several times that it's better to seek after wisdom than it is to seek after silver or gold. Um, we also see in Proverbs chapter 9, wisdom is compared to this very hospitable woman who has prepared this lavish banquet, and she invites all to come in and feast on wisdom. Um, so because of this, because of how positively Proverbs portrays wisdom, you might be surprised uh, to learn that in our passage this e evening, wisdom is actually portrayed negatively, or at least it's going to seem that way at first. Would you be surprised to learn that there's a passage in Scripture where wisdom is not described as bringing joy and blessing and honor and riches, but rather by bringing great pain? So that passage is going to be Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. And if you have your Bibles here or at home, please turn there with me. Ecclesiastes 1.12. Um, it should be in about the middle of your Bibles, a little bit past, it's right past Proverbs. Ecclesiastes 1.12. And we're going to read through the passage. And in a few moments, I'll give you the background. But before I do, we're going to read through this together. I want you to follow along with me. And I want you to listen for how wisdom is described in this passage. Let's look at Ecclesiastes 1.12. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. 
and I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly, I perceive that this also is but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. So last week we were introduced to this book uh, which grapples with deep questions such as the meaning of life. And as Pastor Chris pointed out, uh, some people see the overall message of the book as a positive one, and others see the overall message of the book as a negative one. Um, I agree with Chris that the overall message of the book is positive, um, but you're, as you're going to discover, and as our passage tonight really exemplifies, there are many parts of the book that are going to seem pessimistic. They're going to seem negative. And that's because this book of Ecclesiastes, it deals with life under the sun. That is to say, life here and now on an earth that has been broken and has been marred by sin, uh, life after the fall. So in our passage tonight, um, we're starting a new section that starts with verse 12. And here in this section, we're going to see uh, the first person account of a man named Koheleth, which in English translates as the preacher. And we see that he describes himself in verse 12 as king over Jerusalem. Based on that and some other clues in the text, we have really good reason to think that this is Solomon, but we don't know with 100% certainty. Uh, so the preacher, what he's starting in verse 12 in this first person account, is he's telling us about a journey that he went on, a quest of sorts that he's undertaken. And this quest, what this quest aims to do is to find meaning. And we'll see, starting here in uh, verse 12 of chapter 1, and then going all the way through the end of chapter 2, um, we're going to see that he's going to search everywhere for meaning. Uh, first, in, in our passage tonight, he's going to consider wisdom, to see if wisdom, if meaning is found in wisdom. And in the next chapter, we'll see him explore other potential sources of meaning. He'll, he'll look at pleasure, he'll look at entertainment, he'll look at even alcohol, um, he'll look at work and productivity, um, and he'll even consider riches and material possessions. But in all these things, what we're going to learn is that the preacher's attempts to find meaning are going to come up empty. And he does eventually find meaning, but I don't want to save it, I don't want to steal any thunder from whoever preaches the end of chapter two, so we'll save that for another time. But for tonight, just know that our passage introduces a quest for meaning, and wisdom is going to be the first topic that he's going to be considered but meaning won't be found there. Now, because of that, you might be feeling like you're the victim of a little bit of a bait-and-switch scheme right now, right? Because at the beginning of this message, I started out by describing how great wisdom is, you know, asking you if you wanted more of it, telling you how great it is, and, and here I am now telling you that wisdom doesn't bring meaning, and not only that, the last verse we read says that wisdom brings vexation and sorrow. Well, think of it like this. Uh, what I'm giving you tonight, what this passage gives us, is a disclaimer to wisdom. Um, and wisdom is a good thing, as the book of Proverbs and other passages teach us, um, but it comes with a disclaimer. Uh, have, you, have you ever done like a fun physical activity, uh, maybe like zip lining, and you had to first read a disclaimer and then sign, sign a waiver first before you could do this really good thing? Uh, the example that comes to my mind is a couple of years ago um, on our honeymoon, my wife and I got to go snorkeling in Hawaii, and I'll say it's one of the most incredible experiences of my life, you know, but at the same time, uh, before we went, we had to read this disclaimer that was just daunting and ominous, um, and, and it wasn't just the everyday stuff you'd expect, like, you know, falling off the boat and drowning, but it went into great detail about the, the hazards in the water that could potentially harm us or even eat us, and it could have said something generic, like sea hazards, but instead, it goes on a list, injury or death from coral, from sharks, from sea lions, poisonous jellyfish, scorpion fishes, um, and I can't remember all the things, but it just went on and on and on, and it was really ominous reading this disclaimer. Um, and disclaimers are like that. They're meant to give us a warning, but they are necessary for us to understand what exactly we're getting ourselves into. So this passage tonight, it gives us a disclaimer to wisdom. Uh, but don't worry, I'm not going to make you sign a liability waiver before you leave. Um, and what we're going to see in this passage is this disclaimer has two parts. Um, so we're going to look at both of these parts, and then at the end, we're going to spend just a few minutes connecting our passage tonight with the larger message um, of chapters 1 and 2, and really the book of Ecclesiastes as a whole. Um, so the first part of this two-part disclaimer we're going to see is this, and that is wisdom can't fix what is broken. 
Wisdom can't fix what is broken. And we're going to see this in verses um, 13 through 15. So look with me at verse 13. It says, I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. Um, So in this verse, uh, the preacher is describing now the start of this quest for wisdom, and two things really stand out. Uh, The first thing is just the scope, the broadness of the search. Notice he could have just simply said, I applied my heart to find wisdom, but what he instead says is, I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. This phrase, under heaven, uh, is, is synonymous with the phrase, under the sun. These are used interchangeably in Ecclesiastes. And as I mentioned earlier, what this refers to is life here and now on earth in a broken, fallen world. And so basically, he's saying that he searched out everything done on this earth. Uh, Everything. So that sounds very exhaustive. Um, We're we're hearing from someone who hasn't merely dabbled in wisdom, but this is someone who's mastered the art. He is the wisest of wise. You could say that he's a sage extraordinaire. And if we look ahead at verse 16, we even say that he, he acquires more wisdom than anyone else who came before him in Jerusalem. So what we see is someone who's literally mastered the art of wisdom. So he knows what he's talking about when he gives us his assessment. And the second thing we see in verse, uh, in verse 13 is that we get a hint of the conclusion of this quest. So he calls the pursuit of wisdom, or this business of searching out everything done under heaven, he calls it an unhappy business. And this points forward to the conclusion that uh, wisdom doesn't give life meaning. So we already see that um, hinted at here in verse 13. Now if we go to the next verse, verse 14, It says, I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. In this verse, we come across an important word that was also discussed last week. Um, We see this word vanity. Uh, In the Hebrew, this can literally refer to like a breath or a vapor. Uh, So it's a very concrete word, but applied in a context like this, applied to life, it really refers to just the fleeting, elusive nature of life. And it gets translated usually as futility, as meaningless, or or vanity here in the ESV. And this futility, this vanity, we see this really displayed uh, in the metaphor used in verse 14 of striving after the wind. Can you imagine for a second what it would be like to actually chase the wind? You know, you're running towards the wind, you're trying to catch it in your hands, maybe you've got your butterfly net, you know, you're swiping at the wind trying to catch it. Can you think of something that would be more of an exercise in futility than trying to chase the wind? And so the preachers used wisdom to search out everything that happens on earth, and it all appears to be vanity. Now as we move into verse 15, what we're going to see is we're going to get a different style of writing than the previous verses. So verses 13 and 14 are written in prose, that is, they just read like a normal narrative, but verse 15 is actually poetic, and it's going to take the form of a proverb. Now, in the Bible, a proverb usually consists of two short, pithy statements, and they're usually either closely, they're closely related to one another, and they either contrast um, or they complement one another. And so a couple examples from the book of Proverbs. A wise son makes his father glad, but a foolish son is a disgrace to his mother. See how it's two short statements that sort of complement one another? Another proverb is, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So a proverb, uh, therefore, is just, it's usually two short statements that go together, and they're they're written in a poetic way. And depending on what Bible you're using, uh, it may even be laid out a little differently in your Bible. Not all Bibles do this, but some separate verse 15 and kind of uh, demarcate it a little bit and and lay it out like poetry. Um, And then what we're actually going to see is after verse 15, we're going to see the same pattern repeat. So verses 16 and 17 are also going to be a narrative prose style. And then verse 18 is going to be in the form of a proverb again, like verse 15. So you got the same pattern. Verse 13 and 14 is narrative. Verse 15 is prose. Verse 16 and 17 is narrative again. And then verse 18 is prose. So what this does is this very neatly and evenly breaks our passage in half. And what I'll suggest is that the proverb at the end of each section, it really summarizes the the prose verses that came before. And then it really gives us the meaning of that half of the passage. So look with me now at the proverb in verse 15. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. 
So we have a proverb here that's slightly cryptic, and we need to work just a little bit to decipher it. So I want you to consider with me the first half. What is crooked cannot be made straight? What does this mean? Well, if we look back at the context, we see that the preacher has observed everything under the sun, that is to say everything done here and now on this fallen earth, and it's all vanity. Why is that? Why is it all vanity? And another question is why, or has it always been this way? Has everything always been vanity? Well, if you know your Bibles, you know this isn't the case. You know that when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, uh, sin came into the world and then death, And with that sin and death, that's when futility or vanity was introduced to this world. So everything hasn't always been vanity, but when the fall came, so came vanity. And one cross-reference in the New Testament that really helps illustrate this and put this into perspective is Romans 8.20. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read it to you so we can keep moving. Uh, The Apostle Paul says in Romans 8.20, For the creation was subjected to futility, I'll pause there for a second. Does that word futility sound familiar? Uh, it sounds like our word vanity here in Ecclesiastes. And in the, the Greek version of the, New, or the Old Testament that Paul would have used, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, um, it's the same word that's used in Ecclesiastes for vanity. Um, so Paul would have been familiar with that and maybe even had Ecclesiastes in mind. So let me start over. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So creation has been subjected to this futility or this vanity as a result of the fall. And of course we know that someday this world is going to be freed from that as well when Christ returns. But when we see this vanity in the world, we can also say, in other words, that the world is broken. So what I'm going to suggest is that this phrase, what is crooked cannot be made straight, it simply means that we can't fix the world's brokenness no matter how much wisdom we use. Um, You know, and surely at some point in all of our lives, we've had the experience of trying to fix something that was broken or maybe something that's been bent and we try to bend it back into place and we're unable to. The example that comes to my mind is growing up as a kid playing with slinkies. You know, the slinky toy, that magical spring... um, A slinky, it's such a wonderful toy, it's fun for a girl and boy. You remember the old commercial? Um, So I remember every slinky I ever had as a child, it was fun, but inevitably, every slinky is destined to become bent out of shape. Uh, It might be a simple bend, uh, if if your child was more well-behaved. If your child was more like me, it might just become this hopeless mess of tangled-up metal, uh, more likely the case. And if you've ever tried to fix a slinky, you've probably found that it's, it's impossible. Even just a simple bend, you know, halfway in the slinky, a simple little bend, you're never going to get it back. So the slinky is never going to go back to its original shape. Uh, It's never going to sit flat. You're always going to have the top half sort of pulling away from the bottom half with that little gap. Well, in the same way, the world we live in has been completely bent out of shape by sin, and we lack any ability to fix that brokenness and to bend it back into place. Uh, So we'll move on to the second half of the proverb. And it says that what is missing cannot be counted. And I'll suggest that this also points to the brokenness of this world in just a slightly different way. Um, Not everything in this fallen world quite adds up, does it? And have you ever tried to put together a puzzle and you're missing some of the pieces? So you get it all put together at the end, you're, you're missing some, and that was an exercise in futility? Well, it's the same thing when we try to fix the world's brokenness. We're missing some of the pieces. So... We can't even completely understand the brokenness of this world, let alone try to fix it by wisdom. It's like trying to put together a puzzle without all the pieces. So that is to say, wisdom can't fix what is broken. Now, if you think this passage is a downer so far, I have some bad news. It's actually going to get worse before it gets better, but please stick with me uh, as we work through the rest of this passage. So in this section, we've seen that wisdom can't fix what is broken, And in the next section, we're going to see that not only can wisdom not fix what is broken, wisdom actually makes us more painfully aware of brokenness. Wisdom makes us more painfully aware of brokenness. Uh, So look with me now in verses 16 and 17. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over me in Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to no wisdom and to no madness and folly. 
I perceive that this also is but a striving after wind. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these two verses because they actually repeat much of what was said in verses 13 through 14. Uh, We see that the preacher has now accomplished his mission to acquire great wisdom. He's saying he's now acquired it. Um, And we also see that he mentions uh, this concept of madness and folly. There's going to be a whole section on madness and folly in chapter 2, so I'm not going to really unpack what those terms mean, other than to say that madness and folly are the opposites of wisdom. They're the alternatives to wisdom. So the opposite of being wise is to be a fool uh, or to be a mad person, a crazy person. Uh, So what we see, what this really tells us, again, it hints at the exhaustiveness of the search, the scope of the search. We see that the the preacher, his search for wisdom was so extensive that he even considered all of its alternatives. Um, Since verses 16 and 17 are are pretty similar to 13 and 14, we're going to jump ahead to the proverb in verse 18 to really understand the main point of the section. Let's go ahead and read the proverb in verse 18. For in much wisdom is much much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. So this proverb, it's a little less cryptic than the one in verse 15. Uh, It seems pretty straightforward um, to be saying that wisdom leads to more pain, right? It leads to um, vexation and sorrow, which I would just sum those up by saying pain. More wisdom leads to more pain. And I wouldn't make a huge distinction here between wisdom and knowledge, I'll say that in the Old Testament, you'll discover these are often used interchangeably, especially in the wisdom literature. Um, and again, that, that parallelism, that the contrasting or complementing of these two ideas make these two things pretty synonymous. So the, the idea is the same, that really more wisdom, more knowledge, it brings more pain. So the meaning of that is clear enough, but it, it does leave one question to be answered, which is why? Why does wisdom lead to more pain, more sorrow? Why is this the case? Well, if we look back in the rest of the passage, we see that the focus has been on the vanity of pursuing wisdom. We see that it's called an unhappy business in verse 13. It's called a striving after a wind, after the wind in verses 14 and 17. And so if we use wisdom to observe everything done under heaven, we'll come to the conclusion like the preacher does that what is bent can't be straightened, or in other words, wisdom can't fix what is broken. Um, And so where this brings us, what I'll suggest with all this in view, the reason that wisdom leads to pain is that it makes us aware of that brokenness. It makes us painfully aware of it. Um, When we take the path of wisdom, we discover just how broken the world really is. You know, if we walk around with our head in the clouds, we put on our our rose-colored glasses, we think that ignorance is bliss, um, we can probably skate by for a while and not acknowledge just how fallen this world is, and of course this approach comes with its own problems. But if we do choose the path of wisdom, we're going to come face to face with this brokenness and this ugliness of a world that's been marred by sin, that's been hopelessly bent out of shape and tangled up. Um, and, And what we'll see is that wisdom makes us painfully aware of this brokenness. So what we've seen so far is this two part disclaimer to wisdom that wisdom cannot fix what is broken. And wisdom makes us painfully aware of the brokenness. Well, do you feel encouraged yet? Do you feel like you've been listening to some positive, encouraging K-love? Uh, you're ready to go out of here which, with much rejoicing. Uh, I'm just joking. I can't leave you here. And that's because the preacher doesn't leave us here. Um, we need to connect this passage here in chapter 1 with the larger message of Ecclesiastes uh, to really understand how to apply to our lives what seems like a fairly gloomy passage. Um, What this passage has done for us so far is it's really pointed out a problem we have. Our problem is that we often place our trust in wisdom thinking it's going to fix all our problems, don't we? You know, you got all excited at the beginning when I was listing out all the things we could use more wisdom for, and all of us are thinking, yeah, that sounds great. A little more wisdom, that'll fix all these problems I'm having. But we've seen that wisdom can't do that. And we've seen that wisdom can't fix the world's brokenness. We've seen that it makes us more aware of that brokenness. This is the disclaimer to wisdom. However, disclaimers aren't really the last word, are they? Disclaimers are almost always preceded by, or they precede something good. So when I mentioned snorkeling at the beginning, you know, I mentioned how ominous this disclaimer was, but I really didn't say a whole lot about how wonderful this experience of snorkeling really was. 
I didn't talk about, you know, going under the surface and seeing these bursts of color, you know, seeing the beautiful coral and seeing hundreds of different tropical fish. Um, we also, we saw a sea turtle, and the sea turtle swam right up to us and was inches away from my face. I could have touched it if our guides had told us not to. And I also saw an octopus. You know, I was swimming under the water, and there was this octopus propelling itself along in these short little bursts, and it would fall, you know, kind of slowly sink back down to the bottom. And as soon as it touched the bottom, whatever color rocks it would land on, it would immediately change colors to match its surroundings, to camouflage itself. It was incredible. So this octopus is swimming along and just changing colors with every little burst. So I didn't, I didn't describe how truly wonderful this experience was, um, but whenever we have a disclaimer, it's usually followed by something good and something wonderful. So what I'm going to do here, just at risk of stealing a little bit of thunder on whoever preaches the end of chapter 2, I just want to direct your attention to a moment, for a moment, to um, Ecclesiastes 2.26. It's the last verse of this section that we've sort of started tonight. And it's going to conclude, really, our, our passage in the whole section. Um, Ecclesiastes 2.26. And we're just going to read the first part. because There's one thing I want to pull out of here. Uh, it says, For to a person who is good in his, that is God's sight, he has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. Now first let me know, the person who's good, this isn't someone who's, who's earned favor with God by doing good works. We know from other passages this isn't the case, this is actually impossible. So the person who's good, this is the person who's placed her faith in Christ and has had her sins forgiven and is now justified, or in other words, declared righteous by God. So I just wanted to clarify that so we don't have any misconceptions about what we mean by the good person in God's sight. But the main concept I want to pull out of this verse is that wisdom, it's a gift given to us by God. And that means that wisdom's good, right? Uh, we just got through studying the book of James, and in chapter one it says, every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of lights. So God gives us good things, and wisdom is a gift from God to help us navigate this fallen world. And so when we, when we understand the disclaimer to wisdom, as well as our own limitations, um, and then we recognize that wisdom is this gift from God, what this does is this frees us up to trust in God to handle the world's brokenness. And when we do that, trusting in God, it frees us from both the burden and the illusion that we're in control and that we can fix the world's problems. So if I could just summarize in one sentence the main lesson of this passage in light of its larger context, it's this. Trust in the giver of wisdom, not in the gift itself. Trust in the giver of wisdom, not in the gift itself. Now, this sounds easy enough, right? But how do we put this into practice? I want to suggest just a few practical applications from this truth um, before we close in a few minutes here. The first point of application is this. At some point in all of our lives, there's going to be someone who we wish we could change, right? Someone close to us who starts exhibiting behaviors that really bother us, and we're going to want them to change, now, this could be, you know, that rebellious teenager I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, this could be a spouse, a parent, a friend, a coworker. There'll be someone in our life who we want to fix. Um, but what this passage has really taught us is that we can't do that. We can't fix someone's brokenness, even by using wisdom. You know, we can come up with our best plan, our best scheme, our best form of our acquired wisdom, and we can... Maybe start making passive-aggressive remarks, hoping that'll help them get the hint. You know, we might even confront them. Uh, we might start lecturing them every time we see them to hopefully we can change them through our wisdom. But we can't. Wisdom can't fix the world's brokenness. But if we really internalize the message of this passage, uh, what we can really do is have a huge burden lifted off our backs and that's the burden of feeling like we're responsible to fix people who are broken. If we trust in the giver of wisdom, not in the gift itself, we can leave that person in God's hands. We can pray to the one who is able to change hearts, who is able to fix someone's brokenness. And then what that does is that frees us up to just simply, simply love that person where they're at without trying to fix them. Another point of application, if you're faced with a tough life decision, you know, whether you should go to school, go back to school, whether you should take a certain job, who you should marry, um, buying a house, how to manage your finances. I want to make a couple suggestions about that. 
first, I do encourage you to use wisdom by all means, because again, wisdom is a gift from God given to us to navigate this life. So by all means, you know, weigh the options, count the cost, make your pros and cons list, and then once you've eliminated the options that are either sinful, right, because we don't want to do that, and we also eliminate the options that are unwise, you know, that just go against wisdom, we've eliminated the bad options, and now we're left with a few good options that all seem equally wise, at this point, you don't have to agonize over what to choose. Um, you're not God. You can't foresee all the consequences of your actions. If you're doing what's not sinful, you're doing what's right, and you're doing what's wise, if you trust in the giver of wisdom, not the gift itself, you can prayerfully make that decision, and then you can trust God for the results. There's no second guessing, there's no agonizing once you've used wisdom. And then the last point of application, I want to say a word to the pessimist and the optimist, right? And you know who you are. Uh, if you're at home, your spouse might even be nudging you right now. You know whether or not you're an optimist or a pessimist, whether you see the glass as half full or half empty. Um, for the optimist, I'll say this, you might be tempted to shrink away from these harsh realities we've looked at in Ecclesiastes. You might be tempted to turn a blind eye to the brokenness of this world, but I encourage you not to do that. You see, Ecclesiastes is a very uncomfortable book because it, it's largely a meditation on a world that's been broken by sin. It's been severely marred and twisted, distorted. But we really need to hear its message because God hasn't called us to see the world through rose-colored glasses. Christians, if we're not equipped to consider the brokenness of this world, then, then who is equipped? So if we look at the world realistically as God sees it, and we don't pretend like everything is sunshine and rainbows, that it's positive, encouraging K-love, even when it isn't, um, we can be free. Because actively suppressing any thoughts about the negative effects of sin, it's exhausting. But recognizing the world's brokenness and simply trusting God to take care of it, that's liberating. And to the pessimist, you might be thinking that this is your favorite book of the Bible now. Uh, you might be thinking that this book's perfect, you know, it's so negative and it talks about negative things. But please remember that the, the message doesn't stop at the limitations of wisdom, but it also presses us forward to trusting in God uh, to handle this brokenness. So it doesn't leave us in a state of, of complaining and dwelling on this brokenness. So in the same way that the optimist can be liberated from this just exhausting enterprise of pretending like everything's okay, you also can be uh, liberated from the exhausting enterprise of complaining and getting stuck in your negativity and not trusting God, just by simply trusting God to handle the brokenness. Personally, I'm an optimist about 80% of the time, and it, it can drive my wife crazy at times. She's smiling right now. Um, no matter how bad things get, I'm usually looking for the silver lining, and that's a good quality in many ways, but there are times where it can be a bad thing because it can cause me to see things as better than they actually are. You know, throughout this COVID-19 crisis, I've really been tempted to put on my rose-colored glasses and just pretend like everything's okay. It's been tempting for me to think, hey, next week everything's gonna go back to normal. And then next week comes and I'll say the same thing, hey, well, next week everything's gonna be normal. The problem with this is this can lead to inaction and complacency, and here's why. If I think that normal's coming in just a few days, normal's coming next week, then what I can do is start to put off important things I can start to, uh, I can stop living life because I assume, well, hey, everything's going to be back to normal next week, so why am I going to do all these important things right now? I'll just wait until normal comes. But the problem with this is I, I miss out on opportunities to minister to people now, uh, to engage in fruitful ministry, to reach out to people, to encourage people. However, studying the book of Ecclesiastes has really steered me away from this error what I can say is that by God's grace, it's encouraged me to recognize the brokenness around me, to see the pain that's come about as a result of this crisis, and then to find a way to, uh, to live in this world and to be active um, and, and to trust in God for the brokenness part. And it's, it's allowed me to not be complacent and to really reach out to others. So because of the message of this book, I'm not deluding myself by waiting for normal, but here and now, I'm recognizing the brokenness, and then I'm, I'm going out and acting. I've been able to reach out to others. Again, by God's grace, I'm not bragging, but I'm hoping this can be an encouragement to you. I've been able to 
pray for others, even to reconnect with some friends that I've lost touch with. Um, and that's just come about by trusting in the giver of wisdom, not in the gift itself. And it's come about by me not denying the brokenness around me and pretending like it's going to resolve itself next week. So regardless of your disposition, whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, if you'll just simply recognize the world's brokenness and recognize your inability to fix it, even by wisdom, you can come to a place where you can trust in God, you can trust in the giver of wisdom, not in the gift itself, And when you do that, you can be liberated from carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks um, for this book, for the message of Ecclesiastes. Um, Lord, we recognize that we live in this fallen world, but we give you thanks, Lord, that you have overcome the world, that you sent your son to pay the price, uh, to suffer because of this brokenness. And Lord, we, we look forward to that day when all brokenness will be remedied, Lord, when you return. I pray that you would just help all of us to see the world as it is, not that we can dwell on it, um, not so we can get stuck in the brokenness and, and complain and grumble, but so we can place our trust in you, the giver of wisdom. Father, I pray that you would bless everyone hearing this and listening to this tonight. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.